All right, we can start. Rain, are you ready? Hello, yes, I'm ready. Okay, let me make a short introduction and then uh, we start the chat. So uh, good evening, good afternoon, or even good morning, everyone, wherever you are connecting from. Uh, today we have a great speaker uh, and we will have almost one hour together with him. Bef before that, I will just do a brief in, uh, introduction. Uh, my name is Engin and I'm the chapter director for Startup Grind Tallinn. And uh, before the chapter used to be not so active, actually it wasn't active for about two years and I decided, I decided to relaunch it. So this is our second event and I'm quite excited about that, having great speakers. And I'm also a startup founder myself, my travel tech startup, Hello Experto. It is also one of the partners of Startup Grant uh, Tallinn chapter. And we also have now Startup Estonia as one of our partners and more is coming in the following days and weeks, more partners and more sponsors. Uh, about Startup Grind, it is the world's largest uh, community of startup, uh, startups, founders, innovators and creators, uh, educating, inspiring and connecting three and a half million entrepreneurs around the world in 600 chapters in 125 countries. And before COVID, it used to be with physical events, but now it is all virtual fireside side chats uh, all around the world, just like we are doing now. And uh, the values are, the values of Startup Grind are give before taking, make friends, not contacts, and help others before helping yourself. So uh, that's the idea also that we are here, uh, trying to make a small contribution to Estonian startup ecosystem, having great founders, great entrepreneurs with experience, sharing their experience with us. And uh, apart from that, we are also looking for sponsors and partners more and any, anyone uh, representing any company or institution, you can reach me with my email uh, on the chat later on. And a little bit of uh, housekeeping notes, as you see, we are using Baby platform. It is Startup Grind's own platform and it works based on Google Chrome. So in case you have any technical problems, switch back to Chrome. That's one, uh, the first thing you have to do. You see the attendee list and you can send direct message to anyone there. And also at the very end of the event, I will leave the event 15 minutes more uh, open so you can connect with anyone. Uh, so that's the best time for networking. Before that, we will also have Q&A session, obviously. Uh, when you click chat, there you see Q&A. Please write your questions for the speaker there anytime. And once we start the Q&A session, I will direct them to the speaker. And uh, yeah, so that's all from my side for the boring part. And let's move on to, uh, to the conversation. So welcome once again. Hello, good to be here. Uh, so uh, Ryan is someone quite difficult to define in a few words. It's, we cannot say that, yeah, he is the founder of X or something like that. So he has different roles as a founder, as, an, uh, as a serial, uh, serial entrepreneur, angel investor, and even a filmmaker. We will come to all these details uh, further on, but uh, I want to start with uh, one of your quotes actually from many years ago. So you were saying, like many other people at my age, I had no idea what I wanted to do other than going to university. And then you asked uh, where they had the best professors and they said it, they are in public administration. So you started studying public administration. So mm -hmm. can we start uh, from here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, this is kind of true also for people who want to go to work for a company is that they look for the company that has the best founders, the best people, the best team and try to join that company if you, if you don't know uh, where to go. So it's the kind of the thing that I did back then uh, with my university. Uh, but also, mm, I soon realized uh, uh, that uh, public administration which is basically training the future government uh, officials is not quite um, as a subject uh, right for me because i'm more interested in uh, uh, 
creating things and doing things that wouldn't otherwise exist if I didn't create them. And in technology and in entrepreneurship, uh, there are so much more uh, chances of uh, of creating something that doesn't exist uh, than there would be in, in a government. So I pretty quickly realized that actually I want to build my own company. And uh, that's that's how I, I started. So you, uh, you, you could realize it quite soon, actually, not too late. And then you also had some master in entrepreneurship, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was, um, I, I did my master's uh, like way later um, uh, while already having uh, created the companies. But we created the first companies actually on the second year in, in university. And one of the first projects we did was a company called Mobi, which eventually evolved into Fortumo. And um, and now uh, it's been over 20 years since we started that and the team from Mobi is actually still active and doing projects together and, and we, we still have this, um, you know, what almost by accident started while we were at the university is, is something that, that still exists in one form or the other. So things kind of start, some of the things by accident and by pivoting, I think, from one idea to another. Can you elaborate more on that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the story of uh, Fortumo, which is uh, the main main company I've been associated with the longest period in my life, uh, it started um, almost by an accident. I mean, we didn't have a grand design plan that we wanted to be a global mobile payments provider. But it started um, by us offering simple text message SMS-based services. And then uh, soon afterwards, we realized that we can build a platform that allows anybody to build um, um, SMS-based services. Then we realized that we wanted to offer it outside of Estonia. So we opened it up uh, for Latvia and Lithuania first, like many Estonian companies did back then. And then later on, we realized that, uh, okay, this platform actually can be used globally and the most of the services that people created on that were actually payment services. So we realized that, okay, we want to focus on payments. And then there have been several more of those steps um, uh, that eventually took us to what Fortuma is, uh, is doing now. So I think it's, um, it's a very good... Uh, way of building a company more of like an A-B testing type of model where we just started out with something that we really enjoyed and we wanted to do and we made sense and then that involved the next thing and that involved the next thing and next thing and next thing. And obviously as entrepreneurs we always look for opportunities and try to find solutions to problems that we realize unsolved. And that's what happened with you with Fortumo. So can you tell me, because you have seen that payment was difficult in many developing countries because they had mobile phones, but they didn't have access to credit cards. So it is it is a very, very obvious problem. So how come that uh, not other companies could solve it the way you solved? So how can such a big problem still exist unsolved? Because it's mm-hmm. kind of contradiction. Yeah, I mean, uh, with Fortumo, like back in the days, obviously, like we started Fortumo 13 years ago. So then then it was somewhat bigger. And now the problem, it's been solved and many companies actually solving it. But I think what, what we stumbled upon by accident was that our first platform, it used SMS or text messages uh, for payments. And text messages are not designed for payments mm, by definition. And, um, you know, they, they don't have any secure features and things that, uh, you know, typical payment systems would have. So nobody would consider them for payments. But what we stumbled upon was that uh, unlike the people in developing countries who don't have credit cards, everybody has had a phone and everybody could send text messages. So actually it was an ideal way to do micropayments, the small payments of, uh, you know, 20 cents to maybe like 10 euros and um, and and for that it was an idea so um, um, that's what we kind of stumbled upon and that's what we started to do and eventually you know that found a very big audience uh, uh, in, the, in the gaming industry in the, you know all kinds of app industry and also in social networks and and also in 
in, in, in music and all kinds of you know online services where the payments that people pay per month are pr pretty small. So again, this was something that we stumbled upon and then you know developed and, and went further. And now Fortumus platform is used by Amazon, Spotify, Google, and many of those digital good merchants uh, globally to get money from countries where they wouldn't be able to otherwise um, get money. I see, I see. And during this journey, not necessarily with Fortuna, but in general, uh, some favors that you have experienced, if you would like to share something, failure stories. Uh, failure stories. <laughs> failure, um, yes. It can be a minor one or a major one, something that you learned from. Um, well, it, it's been a constantly, constantly learning process, uh, but uh, we haven't had any any big failures and I think maybe it has partly due to also the, uh, the method how, how we went about building the business is that uh, uh, we tend to take um, many small risks and many small bets and not once in our history there has been a time when we had to make a big bet where we betted the whole company on a single thing. There were always multiple things so if one of the things fails one of the product doesn't take off or some of the customers go away, then we are never being dependent on, on just one thing. And I think that's kind of like uh, uh, by design that I also now as an investor, I recommend to many startups is that uh, you know, if, if you can, then try to take many small bets because most of the ideas you have are not good and they will fail, but uh, most of the companies um, startups, uh, mm, they don't have to fail because if you set it up in a way that in one startup you can you can have like five or ten or twenty small bets until you actually find out uh, what works. Uh, I saw in one of your talks you were also saying that always the initial idea is like useless, mm -hmm. so it it has to be piloted, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if you you know go to um, New industry. And usually, startup founders, they are, especially young startup founders, they are outsiders. They don't know how the industry works. And in, in some ways, it works for their advantage. For instance, when we went to do Fortuma, we didn't know that, you know, how payment industry works. And we had this naive, naive idea that with SMS text messages, you can do payments. And uh, nobody in the right mind in payments industry, an expert in payments industry, would even consider such a thing. But we didn't know. And then, then we, we just did it. So this is on, a, on a one hand, it's, it's very good. But also what it often leads is that if you're outsider of the industry, I mean, you find soon out that your initial conception, you know, wasn't true or it's not actually that easy to disrupt an industry. <laughs> but uh, you wouldn't know it before you try. And always this trial would lead you to um, the next hypothesis that you will test that will again lead to the next thing and next thing. And how is the process for you? Uh, if you, if we compare from idea stage, early stage, uh, comparing it with being a scale up and going further. So, mm -hmm. uh, which part is more exciting for you? And mm -hmm. yeah, how for is me, that? For me, definitely the very early part. Yeah, because I'm a creator at heart and I, I want to create new things and this creation can most uh, uh, the best happen in, in the early stages uh, of, of the company. So the reason why I actually decided to leave uh, running Fortuna full time about six years ago was precisely that company had already grown into the scale up phase and I was more interested in, in working in a, in a very you know, early startup phase, and because that's what what excites me. So I'm clearly a very very early early person. That's why you are enrolled in so many startups or so many different companies as a co-founder or a partner or whatever. I think mm -hmm. that explains. Yeah, I mean, um, at some point uh, we we quite a bit used of this used this incubator idea where we would maybe, you know, think of an industry, we would think about, uh, uh, you know, the products we want to try out, the hypothesis we want to try out. And, um, and I put together a team and we started something out. And my, my initial 
goal was always to give it a kickstart and then have team manage it. So that was kind of like the incubator approach that, that we took at, at some point of time. Uh, but as an investor, which I now also do at, at Super Angel Fund, which is our early stage investment fund, uh, the good thing as an investor is that you get to meet uh, and talk to a lot of the early stage uh, companies and a lot of early stage founders. And um, it's, it's you know, very, very exciting on the one hand to, to learn about different companies, their industries and, and you know, trying to help, help them to grow. Uh, but also it's very different from being a founder because as an investor, you never have a skin in the game fully. You can only give advice and you, you, sh you should only give advice as an investor. You should not uh, try to run the company for the founders. It will never succeed. So you always more or less hands off. And, uh, uh, and, and that's very different from being a founder where you have you know, skin in the game 100% and 120%. So oftentimes it's actually way more exciting to be uh, actually founder who has the skin in the game and who has to actually you know, make things happen because all great companies are built by founders and not investors. And this looks like a very smooth and very natural way, which I observe in uh, many successful entrepreneurs after a while the real successful ones after a while they do some exits and they become angel investors or somehow uh, turn to be an investor of some kind so mm -hmm. that also applies to you so it is it kind of how it works i mean uh you know what i'm trying to ask mm -hmm. maybe i put it in another other way because the ecosystem has this dynamic, so some things go with the flow naturally. Is it how it happens or do you do it with a more conscious decision to be an investor or not? Mm -hmm. I think it's in a way uh, how it happens, because if you're a successful founder, then you, first of all, you have knowledge of industry and you know how to build a startup and you also have connections uh, to other founders as founders, especially in Estonia, but I would imagine in many other places, they stick together, they talk a lot, they share experiences. And, um, you know, of course, like when, when somebody is raising new money, then they, they also ask for their entrepreneur friends to invest. Um, and that's a very typical way. And that's kind of how we started out as well. When we made our, uh, me and my partners, we made our first investments uh, into fellow startups uh, in Estonia. Like one of the first deals we did was pipe drive. Uh, one of the other first ones was uh, was Taxify, which is now called Bolt. And all those deals happened because uh, um, their founders gave, came to us, uh, they came to me for advice and also at some point for money. And you know, it was a very logical thing how, how we would involve um, to an investor. Uh, but I think at some point, um, it's, it, it has to be more of a conscious decision. And I think for us, uh, that point came uh, when we established the fund, investment fund, Super Angel, about three years ago. Because at that point, you're not only investing your own money, but you're also investing other people's money. And then uh, you have to build the pro professional processes to actually uh, find the companies and to, to uh, help the companies. So right now, Super Angel, we started out with you know, three partners, but now we have actually eight people uh, working um, with about uh, almost 40 portfolio companies across all stages. And, uh, and this is a very, very different, you know, than eight years ago when we made our first angel investments, just as individual angels. Mm -hmm. And we all uh, know about the product market fit and how, how about the founder market fit? How do you see it uh, from the investor point of view when you are choosing the founders, the startups according to their founders within mm -hmm. your criteria? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I tend to talk a lot about founder market fit precisely because oftentimes in early stages, uh, um, you, you might not have a right product yet or you haven't, uh, you know, find really what works, uh, but we are clearly interested in 
co-founders who have an ability and motivation to go after a chosen market uh, and strong enough motivation to keep going in that market for five years or, or even longer because it takes a very long time to build a company and um, almost always there needs to be a passionate person or a passionate team who sticks around for long enough until he, she or they find the product market fit. So we are looking at founders who uh, live and breathe this industry where they have chosen to create their startup in and uh, who we often, you know, if they wouldn't be able to do that, we wouldn't know like what, what they would do if they didn't do this particular thing. So we, we want to find, uh, you know, this kind of thing, especially in the early stage. Mm -hmm. And also their story is important, I guess, right? The story, I mean, uh, how they transmit their idea the, uh, to the clients, it can be B2C or B2P. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I oftentimes like the Silicon Valley, mm, mm, this kind of myth is that you have to be able to, you know, pitch your idea like in, in 20 seconds until you ride from elevator from the first floor to, I don't know, third floor, like the elevator pitch thing. Um, I don't think that the pitch is most important thing. Uh, and especially this elevator pitch is most important thing. Uh, however, um, uh, the founder needs to be able to explain his or her idea very clearly to investors because, uh, you know, if he can explain it to investors, then uh, uh, he can also explain it to employees and then he can, he can, she can explain it to clients. So, you know, this is important and usually the ability to explain something well comes from clarity. If you have thought about this idea or lived with it for like many with this industry, many, many, you know, years uh, and and then you have formed some clear thoughts that they are also able to communicate and articulate well so clearly this is important but i think the story is not something that you can actually come up in 15 minutes uh, or but the story is something that you have lived with and then you are telling this thing that you're actually living and they should even be able to explain it in very tough conditions, right? Uh, for those who don't know, you can go to Super Angel YouTube channel and you see people doing pitches, jumping off from an airplane, skydiving mm -hmm. in ice, ice drifting cars. And yeah. also, I wouldn't, go, I, have... I wouldn't overemphasize those because those are something that we have done at tech conferences, at events, uh, as more of a fun thing. So we yeah, actually yeah. never <laughs> select the founder based on the pitch that they would do while falling out an airplane on a parachute, because that's, that's more like, a, you know, a different thing. It is a, it is a metaphor uh, in the end. It's a metaphor because, because um, exactly, in a, mm, you know, founder often you have to be able to, you know, typically like founding companies basically like jumping out of an airplane where you're moving very fast and you are going to hit the ground very soon. Uh, and you have to, you know, think very quickly and communicate very quickly while you are falling at the ground so that you can get customers, you can get money uh, to avoid falling. So, so it's, it's clearly a metaphor. And the most recent um, uh, thing we did about a year ago was a granny pitch, which is also in a way a, a metaphor, because it, especially if you do a consumer product, you have to be able to explain it uh, so easily that your grandma would also understand it oftentimes and um, and we actually then had I, I i watched all those uh, pitches they are especially the granny ones are really fun yeah 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 the videos are up in the youtube you can watch it but we actually had uh, two grannies and one grandpa as a panel or and, and they were judging the pitches and again like you wouldn't make an investment decision based on any of those pitches because as an investor, you would need so much more or so much like different things. But uh, again, as a metaphor, it, it, uh, as an event, it works very well. So do you want to talk also about the other activities you do under Super Angel, like the uh, base camp, science base camp, mm -hmm. and the other ones which you find more relevant or important? Yeah. So um, 
I'm actually also one of the founders of um, of the thing called Crash 48, which is, um, for those who don't know, is a series of hackathons that uh, we started about 10 years ago, where, um, you know, at that time, there was this understanding that building a startup or building a company or a product is like super hard and, and companies often, uh, you know, developed something for two years and then they had early prototype and then they showed it to customers and then they found out that uh, nobody really wants it and it's something that only they and their two friends would use. So we started Garage 48 as a way to break that kind of thinking. Um, so in Garage 48, you would get to it on Friday evening and by Saturday evening, you would already have a product. So the base camp that we do now at Super Angel is, is kind of like an advancement of that, where we are taking already existing teams that we, into which we are considering uh, investment, and we are uh, bringing them together, either physically or now virtually, to work uh, under our close supervision for 48 hours so that we can really see their team dynamics, we can really see how they actually build things, and, and we, can, we can really see you know, how they are as a team and how they are as a, as a potential company where we invest in. So we have found that to be super useful way. And it's also been very useful for the companies because usually they're able to build something in, in 48 hours. They can add a new feature to the product or maybe you know, build a new marketing campaign or do something completely new. So the base camp is actually... So what, what uh, can I interrupt? What is the success rate of these products uh, built in 48 hours? Mm -hmm. At least the idea to survive or be turn to a real product in the future? Mm -hmm. it's, it's not very big, but that's not the point. <laughs> because the point is uh, that uh, usually, like I said earlier, it leads to something else. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, uh, you know, and there, there have been some success stories, like uh, like for Garage 48, uh, one of the success stories was a face filter app uh, built in a Belarus event um, about five years ago. And they, they built it in Garage 48 and uh, the company was purchased, bought by Facebook uh, three months later for about 300 million. And now it's all those cat filters in Facebook. Uh, uh, that you can add to your messenger chats are actually, you know, built by a company that got started in Garage 48. So there are success stories, um, but, but I think how I look at it is that every participant is successful because first of all, they learn something and maybe they will build some kind of new belief that they didn't believe was possible. Maybe they met a new person that uh, they find useful, like maybe they start something later on. and. And yes, sometimes you build a company that you will, you know, that will become successful. So again, with this base camp, 48 hour hackathons we do at Super Angel, uh, we, we tend to think that uh, in whatever stage you are with your company, uh, it's likely gonna be useful because you will build something new, learn something new, meet somebody new, or get some insight that you otherwise wouldn't have. So. So now we do them as part of the value add package that, that we at Super Angel uh, offer to all companies. Okay. So from being an investor, let's move to being a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. You don't have any formal education to be a filmmaker. You have never been in a film set before your own film that you were directing, the mm -hmm. one, uh, The Chasing Ponies, the first one. So uh, how, how, how does it work? Uh, before also, I want to mention this because it's interesting from my side. I watched Chasing, uh, Chasing Unicorns and after watching it, I thought, okay, I should invite the direct, I should see who is the director and uh, ideally invite him if he or she accepts to be uh, my guest because I really like the movie and it touches lots of points. And then I realized that it was you and I was quite surprised to be honest because I was waiting, uh, I mean, a filmmaker more coming from an artistic side or with a filmmaking background. Mm -hmm. And then you with all your success in the entrepreneurial world also having a success in a totally different area. 
So I was quite impressed, to be honest, that I wanted to share it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think that's uh, partly due to the startup model that we decided, I decided to employ when I was thinking of the new industry. Like I said, I like to create things and, uh, and uh, I'm a creative person. So when I got interested in movies, then the reason was that in, in the movie process, it's kind of like building a startup where you bring in people with different skills. In startup, you would find programmers, designers, uh, um, you know, different people who create products. And in movies, you would bring uh, together people who are um, good at with camera, good with sound, good with acting, and you create a different type of uh, you know product in a way, more of a creative product. So th when I became interested in movies, then the method I applied was exactly how I would do a startup, which is that I would just do, do it and see what happens. So the first movie mm, we did in 2015, we filmed it uh, exactly the first day on the set was my first day on a movie set ever. Uh, and, and I just learned by doing. And, uh, and we had luckily a very motivated team with us and, and we pulled it off. And then it, it came out, um, uh, you know, considering how we made it, uh, I haven't watched it like since the premiere of that movie. So I don't know how I would feel about it right now, but it came out, uh, you know, something that uh, based on the skills we had back then was, uh, you know, the best we could do. And then for the next project, obviously we had all learned a lot and, uh, and we, uh, you know, did it uh, differently. And, uh, and this came out very well. It's been, you know, getting a lot of um, mm, mm, uh, people uh, watching it in Estonian cinemas. We had about 30,000 people, which is about five times more than there are people in Estonian startups. So it traveled very well. And um, like almost everybody in the startup industry has found, uh, you know, good things um, relating to their life, which I think is a, a very good thing is that the movie should be an entertainment, but you should also be able to learn something. So we were super happy. And now we are doing uh, the next one where we hopefully have learned even more and then so on and so on. So I think for me, it's kind of like if I was a founder and I went to a new field, like let's say I would do a FinTech service, then I would probably start the same way is that I would start doing something and I would learn something and then I would do something else. And to learn a new field, in startups, it could take you anywhere from three to five to 10 years. And I think the same thing with movies is that uh, our learning or my learning process started when I started writing the first movie. And now it's been like six, seven years and from that point, and, uh, you know, if you focus on something for six, seven years, then you obviously learn something. It's all about the mindset, the startup mindset, the entrepreneurial uh, character you have that you are applying to movie making. And uh, you bring your uh, experience to movie making, your experience from uh, entrepreneurship. And how does it work vice versa? Things that you learn in the field, um, making your movie, how does that experience, what does that experience teach you, which you can apply to be being an investor, for example, mm -hmm. or founding your next company in another field? What did it teach you? Mm, I think it um, um, teaches like many things because how we actually do movies, we are kind of like doing a startup. So that means that we need to find, you know, distributors, we need to find partners, uh, we, uh, we have to do certain deals to, to make sure that the movies reach somewhere. And um, what we learn from this deal making is applicable to also other startups. And actually, what I learned when I built my own startup uh, in terms of the business aspects, I can now apply in the, in the movie industry. So, so it's clearly related. But there are also some, some differences. And like one of the differences is that when you do a startup and it's successful, it will never end. Like you have to do it for like five, 10, 15 years. But each movie is a two year or three year project maximum. So you can make a movie and, um, you know, it does however it does, but, uh, but, but then it's over. And then you make another one if you want, which is again like two or three year project. And then you make another one. 
So it, in some ways, it's much more like structured. Whereas with startups, uh, the more successful you are, the longer you're going to do it. Like, and if you like Jeff Bezos, you're going to do it for 30 years. So, so I think this is one of the key difference from the like, founder's perspective between the movie industry and, and the technology industry is the, is the timeline. And you are more working on the next one. So is it, will it be again related with startup world or something else? Do we have some teaser? Uh, the next movie will be um, broadly related to um, AI or artificial intelligence. So, okay. and, and hopefully, depending on how, how it goes, uh, hopefully it will come out late this year or maybe next year, depending on COVID and all the other situations as well. All right, all right. And yeah, before taking the questions, I have... If a few more questions. So about the ecosystem in Estonia, mm -hmm. uh, what are the positive and negative sides you see and what you believe can be improved? Because the idea is all together uh, different actors in the ecosystem to improve it for the sake of everyone. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you see? Yeah, I think Estonia is... Um, and, and it's been proven that it's a great place to start the company. And, uh, you know, if I look at it, um, I lived in Silicon Valley um, some time and I've been in different startup communities around the world. And 10, uh, ten years ago, um, Silicon Valley was widely considered the only place where you could scale a company uh, because only that place had the investors, had the knowledge, had the right people, and it was a widely held belief. And when we was Vortumo, we started going to Silicon Valley first about 12 years ago. Then advice we got from investors is that you only have to move your, you have to move your headquarters here and you have to be uh, and act and, and, and feel like a Silicon Valley company. Only then you can be successful to selling the likes of Google and Facebook. And that now has dramatically changed. It's been a, a wide fact a proven fact now that you can build a world-class company from very many places and Estonia has clearly emerged as one of those places where you can very successfully do it. And what I have noticed, uh, especially in the last uh, three to five years, is that, uh, and I don't know about your story, but what I've noticed is that many people come to Estonia to build their startup, uh, much like the same way that uh, everybody went to Silicon Valley 15 years ago to build their startup, but now actually people are coming here to do it from all around the world because we have this um, you know, knowledge and processes and people and investment capital and everything in the ecosystem that you need to, to, to build the company. Um, uh, about disadvantages, I don't think it's really a disadvantage and maybe it's an advantage, but obviously Estonia is a small home market. We only have 1.3 million people. So what this means is that uh, uh, you already have to build something that's global from the, from the get-go. Whereas in many big countries, you could first build something for the home market. And then what happens is that if you're moderately successful in your own, ma own home market, then you never get to the point where you actually make the push to do something super hard and, and try to offer it to another country. But in Estonia, our home market is almost non-existent and we always kind of have to do it. And if we successfully do it already with one market or two markets, then we are very likely to do it also with 10 or 20 or 30 markets. So uh, we, we kind of have to be global from the start. Okay, okay. Uh, I will move to the questions from the audience. And again, if you have next questions, please write it in the Q&A or in the chat. So, Krista is asking, what kind of a business would you make if you had to start over? What would be the steps to success? Um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't even matter what kind of business. I mean, right now, I, I kind of consider making movies my startup or my business. So I would, uh, I would absolutely do that because that's what I'm doing right now. And when I feel that I don't want to do it, uh, then is the time when I when I look for the next thing. So, uh, I mean, uh, 
I, I would I would definitely do movies, but I think the thing that is important when you consider what to do is that uh, first of all it needs to be a thing that you are passionate about because if you're not passionate about then you're not going to last for three five ten years and you know building something is going to be super hard and if you're not passionate about about this field then you're not going to last um, when it gets hard uh, so I kind of like as a philosophy is that uh, you always have to have problems to solve because otherwise life is boring. You don't develop and you, you're gonna have, you have to have problems to solve. But uh, the best is to have uh, the kinds of problems that you invo- and enjoy solving. And, uh, and you know, the field you choose has to have a lot of those. Uh, in addition to that, I also think that it's helpful if you can find a growing market or something that is growing or, uh, or mostly aligned with some kind of global trend. Because if... Uh, you are, you know, passionate about an industry that actually a declining industry, then it might be somewhat harder to, you know, stick around. And you're kind of like, you always have this uh, wind blowing against you and not, uh, not with you. So ideally, you find something you're passionate about that's also in a, in a growing industry. And then maybe you would also look at... Uh, some of the unique advantages that you might have to attack that business. Like, is there something in your previous background or your country's background or your team's background that would position you to solve this particular problem potentially better than anybody else in the world? So the intersection of passion, good market and and your unique skills. And, And that's how I would go about the process of finding what to do next. Okay, makes sense. Uh, next question from Scott. Uh, actually, it's not a question. Filmmaking and entrepreneurship share a lot in common. Mm-hmm. Both are taking ideas to fruition while building a company, mm-hmm. fellow filmmaker and startup founder. So it was a comment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, we have another question from Gleb. How do you measure founder market fit? Is it a gut-based decision or made of, um, or more of a data-driven one? It it's more like gut gut-based, and that gut always comes from um, having multiple conversations with the founder, and and also look, of course, at the data that they provide. For instance, I very clearly remember. Uh, when when we first invested into into Taxify, they were not early guys. They were only in Estonia back then, uh, and um, and now, if you don't know, that's one of the Estonian unicorns, uh, most one of the most successful um, Uber and Lyft competitors in emerging markets. Mm. So, uh, so uh, I remember the first meeting um, when we had when the founder's story made so much sense and actually they, he also provided uh, the PowerPoint uh, and the numbers that uh, clearly showed that he was, uh, had thought this industry through and from the meeting and actually multiple meetings we got the idea that okay this guy is really set out to find something that works in this industry and change it. So it's kind of like it's always subjective because it, if it were objective, then you could uh, basically, you know, have a machine to do it. But, uh, but so far, venture investing has been one of the areas that has not been um, you know, fully substituted by machines yet. Maybe it will happen in the future, but, but right now you still kind of need people and their gut feeling. But I think this gut feeling comes from seeing many, many, many different uh, companies and talking with many, many different founders. So, uh, you know... Uh, Seeing the pattern probably, right? Some yeah, kind of pattern. Yeah. Some pattern that you... Maybe it's similar to machine learning in a way, but we know how humans learn is that we kind of subconsciously build the patterns and, and you know, the more data we have, the, the quicker we typically form an opinion of, uh, 
of what works. But all, of course, always, you know, startups are built on unpredictability. And oftentimes, the, some of the most successful founders turn out to be people that don't fit into any pattern. And, you know, that's why every investor has, you know, many founders or companies that they have said no to that have mm, eventually turned out to be super successful. So that's part of the, part of the business, I guess. All right. Okay, another question. Are you doing anything special in marketing for the AI movie? For example, a small game or small website that does something fun. Would you like to team up and make something cool? So you have an offer here. <laughs> sure, absolutely. I would love to talk. Um, so I can share my contacts to the person, contact with the person who, but absolutely, yeah, why not? I mean, clearly about, um, you know, that there are so much movies made uh, and so much content and, and so much, you know, creative things produced in the world that, uh, you know, to stand out, uh, it's similar to startups, you have to do something different, something unique and, and we are very open to, to explore that. We have another question. I don't know if you would like to answer it, but I will shoot it anyway. What companies are in your anti-portfolio? Anti, anti uh, what companies are in our anti-portfolio? <laughs> Actually, uh, some of the companies in our anti-portfolio are the same companies that are in our portfolio. Like I talked about Polter Taxify, we actually, I said no to them the first time when I hadn't found the, met the founder yet, but I just saw the PowerPoint without any knowing about the founder. Um, we also, I also said no to Bike Drive the first two times they came to us. Um, uh, and we only invested in the third time, which was still pretty early, but, but again, like oftentimes. So I think in Estonia... So what, changed, what changed from the second and the third time then? What was the main change? Uh, for Pipedrive, actually, uh, the main change was that uh, internally, before that, we did not feel that we have capital or we, we didn't like actively engage in investing yet. And the third time we were. But we spoiled uh, the first time, yeah, like I said, I hadn't met the founder, I just saw the PowerPoint and based on the PowerPoint, it didn't look uh, necessarily so good, but when we had this PowerPoint together with a very passionate founder, then it suddenly was a, was a different story. So, so that's what happens. So I think also as an investor in, in Estonia, which is kind of a good thing is that you often tend to get uh, another chance. And that another chance may come at a later stage at a much higher price, but, uh, but typically you do, uh, you know, if you're a value-added investor and if you, you know, and add something to the company, then you have a chance to do it later on as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one more question. Uh, even by the Silicon Valley's measures, Moby track record of angel investing would be awesome. How would you explain what has been the main driver of success with such a number of successful cases? Um, yeah, that's true. That actually, if you look at our portfolio multipliers, um, they're absolutely amazing <laughs> for Silicon Valley standards. I think there are a couple of things, but one of the things I, I clearly think uh, is also what I said earlier is that uh, if you're in a growing market, then you have to be like super dumb not to be successful because sometimes just the market drives you. And if we look at Estonia, a country of 1.3 million people over the last decade has produced uh, five unicorns and many, many successful like 100 million dollar worth companies, there are not so many 1 million people places in the world that have the similar track record. So I think one of the things that has worked well for us was that we were in Estonia at a time when, when this startup ecosystem took off and we were here at a time when, uh, when we were also valued as an investors and, and, and the companies wanted us as investors because we, they think that we can add some value. So it has something to do with also being in the right place at the right time. Okay. And one more question from my side. 
uh, with all your experience and knowledge you have right now, what would you do differently, let's say 10 years ago? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, as an investor, I would definitely invest like way more into companies uh, that we had, had a good feeling about. So always like one of the regrets you may have as an investor is that, okay, I, I maybe did invest, but I didn't invest as much as I could have invested, like try to diversify too much or, or, or like rationalize so so maybe that's the only thing is is that sometimes being too cautious but at the same time uh, you know having many bets where not none of the like not, not one single bet would make it or break it would, would also be something that uh, i as an entrepreneur consider a wise strategy if you can have it is that you can have multiple attempts until you, until you find something. Mm -hmm. And one more thing I'm always very curious about with people who have success and who have done big jobs, I always ask this question uh, about uh, work-life balance. How doing lots of things and having a good life, how do you balance it? Mm -hmm. I am a big believer in balance, but I don't think the balance needs to happen on a, on a daily basis or even on a weekly basis. And what I mean by that is I'm a big believer in what some people call like seasons, meaning that sometimes, uh, like let's say I give an example now as a filmmaker, when I'm shooting a movie, then I do it often with 20 or 30 days. And uh, when you're in a shooting period, there's not much balance, like 100% of your life and time goes to thinking of the movie. And, and you have no like balance. And I think that is uh, productive because if you are single-mindedly obsessed about one thing um, for a period of time, then you do that one thing so much better than you would if you would share your attention between many things at the same time. But then again, once the movie is shot, then you might want to, you know, take another month or two weeks or whatever you can and maybe spend it with the kids or spend it with the family or do something completely like you know different and not work at all so and and, and during those times can, can you really disconnect your mind from other things when you're out with uh, on your free time or outdoors i know you do outdoors camping can you totally disconnect your yeah, mind traveling, absolutely absolutely I mean, not okay. like totally, totally, because you're always like thinking about like, you know, yeah, when it was the thing like when I'm hiking up the mountain, then, you know, the ideas just come to you or when I'm jogging or running, then obviously your head is always like thinking. So, so um, yes, in that sense, uh, you know, maybe not fully, uh, but again, like, uh, I, I'm a big believer and now I'm trying to create in my life those periods where I'm focusing uh, on a longer period of time on, on one thing. Uh, for instance, when I'm writing a new movie script, I do that for one month and I have no meetings at all. And, and then when I'm doing meetings, I try to put them all in one day or two days in a week and have like 10 meetings in a day and, uh, and, and, and focus on that and create the larger chunks of time where I'm, I'm, I'm doing only one thing. Okay. So uh, we have a few more minutes and I will shoot you my final questions, but in a very fast way, rapid fire questions. Are you ready? Let's try. Not, not, I'm not, not sure. Not not Let's try. Okay. If any of them you want to skip, you just skip. <laughs> Okay, winter or summer? Uh, summer. Five star hotel or camping in a tent under the stars? Mm, like a yeah, billion star hotel, like stars. <laughs> Tea or coffee? Coffee. Any nickname if you had when you were a child maybe? No, I didn't. Uh, do you have any undiscovered but useless talent? 
the what? Uh, any talent you, talent you have, something you can do well, which is undiscovered, and maybe it is also useless. <laughs> yeah, I can't uh, think of um, of anything uh, on top of my head. That's like completely okay. No problem. Covered. Are you a morning person or a night owl? Uh, it depends. It really depends on what type of season or what type of work I'm in. Mean, I, when I came back from my last trip about a month ago, then I, I developed um, by accident for, for for ten days. I was in a schedule where I went to sleep at uh, at eight p.m. Sorry, I woke up at eight p.m. and I, I went to sleep at eleven a.m. or twelve a.m. So I was living completely in a night for ten days, and I found that super good because uh, I could go running in the middle of the night in a city, and I could run like in the um, in the middle of the main street um, and there were no cars and like it was completely mine <laughs> and also I could focus my work much better at night time so it worked like super well but I, I tend to like uh, um, diversity and, and being able to experiment with different types of uh, schedules lifestyles and, and things okay favorite type of music hip-hop Favorite type of movie? <laughs> I like movies that are um, made by um, visionary filmmakers, or good filmmakers that have a specific, unique uh, vision. I like movies that are uh, fast and not slow. I tend to like movies that are fun more so than super serious. Okay. On a plane, window or aisle seat? Window. Something on your bucket list, but not business related. Hmm. Something on my bucket list, not business related. Um, um I think it's it, it has to be travel related. I I, I eventually I, want to travel in in every country in the world, and I, I figured out that if I do four new countries every year on average, then I, I, I should get there before I'm, I think like 70, 70 or 80, I don't remember the exact time. But, uh, so but, you have even KPIs for that. Yeah, I made some KPIs and I'm, I'm, I'm right now, I'm currently on track, so we'll see how it develops. It's not something I think about very often, but uh, why not? Okay. Favorite food? Um, American food. Uh, you receive a work-related call when you are on holiday. Uh, you answer or reject? Um, I it depends. But when I'm on holiday, I tend to get uh, these days local SIM cards, so nobody can call me. And I also tend to turn off uh, social media, email, and and many other things. So I, w I would be very hard to reach by by such a call. Okay. And final question, uh, something you are terrible at. How oh, many things? <laughs> no, <laughs> cooking. All right. Thank you so much. Seriously, it's been a big pleasure for me. And I hope uh, the audience, and I'm sure the audience learned a lot of things from you. Do you have anything else to add? Yeah, I mean, if you haven't checked it out yet, then chasingunicornsmovie.com is where you can watch uh, my latest movie. And also we have uh, there chasingunicornsmovie.com slash school, where we have uh, a lot of fun educational materials for building your company, building your startup. So check uh, those out as well. And And yeah, I mean... <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks a lot. And I had already put the link on the chat. If anyone wants to click, you can go directly from there. So, Ryan, thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure. And thanks, everyone, for participating, for being uh, with us today. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, 
we I will keep the event as I mentioned uh, on for uh, the next 15 minutes. I will I will turn off the video, of course. But anyone, if you want to network, talk with the other, just feel free. And uh, we will be announcing the next events of Startup Grand Tallinn. Uh, just join the chapter if you haven't, so you get the updates. And that's it from our side for today. Thank you very much once again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.